there, everybody, and welcome to the Hard Truth Inside the Football Industry podcast with me, Philip Eidson, and Darren McAnthony, chairman and co-owner of English Championship side, Peter B. United. <laughs> what a week. <laughs> what a, yeah, what a week. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. fucking movie. What a week. We are going up, Sid. We are going. We are up. <laughs> so it, it wasn't always looking like um, roses, you know. <laughs> Talk me through the last week. Well, to be fair, Tuesday, you know, I went down to the club. I wasn't feeling great, like, physically. I was fucking, my chest was just, like, so tight. And I was just so stressed. And in fairness, the manager was pretty relaxed. Obviously, we go out and we batter Doncaster for 25 minutes. Mm-hmm. It should have been five up or two up. You're thinking, okay. And then I'm, but again, like, everyone's celebrating, and I'm pretty much still, because I've been here before. You know, so many shitty things have happened. And then obviously the fire, and I know the fans got upset. They were blamed for the fireworks. Look, my wife actually was the one who said to me after, you can't blame fans for fireworks. They've, they've been locked up for a year and they haven't been allowed out of their houses. So allow them to have a little bit of fun. Mm-hmm. But in that moment in time, you're playing a team who've won one and 12. You're battering them. And it, it almost, um, again, not blaming the players. It spooked our fucking players and the ref. The ref was actually saying, I was told by my CEO, they call the game off mm-hmm. because the fireworks were landing on the fucking pitch. So I'm saying to the CEO, can we get the fucking security and police round to, and he goes, well, it's in a pub and it's on a bridge. And it was just, if anyone who watched the game, it did spook us, yeah. which it shouldn't have. Listen, in, 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 in defense of the fans, that shouldn't spook professionals. And obviously Doncaster, for whatever reason, you know, didn't like hearing fireworks. And then they woke up after 12 games and started playing their best football. So, but in saying that, you know, we had so many chances. I mean, we hit the fucking bar four three times. Mm-hmm. You know I mean, the referee is an absolute penalty, you know, in the second half and fucking wasn't given. You know, Beavers is five yards out and fucking kicks it straight at the goalie. So it's just one of them nights and I'm just sitting there and fucking it's just... And afterwards, obviously angry, very angry. I mean, I was physically angry. I was yeah. fucking tearing doors, you know, ready to do damage to myself, you know, in, in my office. I was, I was so angry, you wouldn't believe it. But... I went downstairs and I waited for the manager because I wanted to make sure he was okay because he had an important few days ahead with the players because you're deflated, the dressing room's deflated and you've got to go again on Saturday. And we already knew Lincoln had won. The worst part for me, Phil, and this 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 because you know I'm a superstitious bastard, I mean, this will make you laugh, right? I pulled into the club Tuesday night, an hour before the game, and there's a van from the EFL is, is, is loading stuff into the front reception. And it's all the congratulations, all that, all the stuff. Now, mm-hmm. they do that. You have to take their stuff. Do you know what I mean? When they, when they, they, they send it over. Off when channel. the van shows up. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, and I'm losing my shit like a half six. Why is this stuff here? And because if Doncaster see that in reception, not only that, I'm superstitious. And I'm looking at all these t-shirts and paraphernalia and all the promotion stuff. So we didn't order it. EFL sent it. So, so that was the first star and that wasn't a good omen. So, you know, after the game, obviously a good chat with a gaffer. I just said, look, we, you know, we need to like chill, get going again this week. Then I left him alone for a couple of days and I spoke to him on the Thursday and Friday and he, and he was as cool as you like. And that's sometimes good. I'm the manager who's been promoted four times already. Mm-hmm. So, and I think they didn't do a lot of training. I think you took the players for a walk around the city, just chilled, just talked about it. I gave him an idea that, you know, why don't you get all the families to do videos instead of a player's video with all the footage? Why don't you get all the families to do, you know, uh, a video for the Saturday? Um, mm. because they stayed in the hotel on Friday night. So I know they did the video and the wives, you know, parents, brothers, sisters, everyone had like a little thing from their family. So I thought, you know, sometimes we forget that when we go to work or we go to battle or we play in sports, it's not just for us. It's, it's for, it's for the, you can almost call them, you know, prisoners, sometimes your family, because mm. you know, they go through so much. You know, I know mine does, you know, my wife on Wednesday was checking to see if I'm still alive because I was so bad when I FaceTimed on Tuesday night at one in the morning. I was in such a bad way. And she's checking on Wednesday to see if I'm okay, you know, because, and again, she's getting put through the ringer. So, you know, off the back of that, that's when I thought, well, you know what? It's not just my wife. There's everyone's probably families are going through this and it's painful and, and, and it's horrible. So Saturday, it was interesting because I, I woke up and I had a word with myself, like seriously, like talking in the mirror to myself going, you, you've got to stop going as if it's a prison sentence to watch a football game. It's not why you bought a football club. 
you know, you've done your bit. You've got to believe in the process. I can't do it. I, I can't kick the ball. Yeah. Yes, I can put the team together. Yes, I can work on the recruitment. Yes, I can give the gaffer, the players, all the assets, the tools, you know, whatever. My partner's fucking are a big part of that, you know. So we've done all our bit. So I so said, I've got to go to this game. And I've got to try and enjoy it, uh, as, as torturous as that sounds. And and a friend of mine who used to do a lot of driving for me is 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 he's got a very bad pancreatic cancer, mm-hmm. and he's probably never going to get to see a game. So I got him to the game, and because I wanted him there as well, because I knew, you know, looking at him and going, "Fuck me, I'm I'm acting like a lunatic over a game of football," and this man's fighting for his fucking life. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So. The game started, um, you know, we probably had the best chances. We definitely should have won a penalty. Their players dived to the left and fucking basically palmed the fucking ball away. Um, obviously, they go down and score. And then you're thinking, okay, you get to half time, you regroup, and the gaffer will get into them. And then obviously, what happened at half time? You know, fucking worst thing. So, massive setbacks for the players. And then, you know, and then you come out and you're thinking next goal is really important. We get like a set piece. Jono, you know, the best marksman in the AFL, misses an absolute fucking sitter because he probably thinks he's offside when he's not. So then you're thinking, fuck me. They go down then and they score a fucking worldie. I mean, an absolute fucking yeah, worldie. Yeah, you weren't picking that one out. Yeah, they're celebrating in the corner. I mean, you know, everyone around me is. But, but for whatever reason, I'm thinking... You know, everyone's going to call us bottle jobs and chokers. And I'm sure lots of people did at that stage. I'm sure everyone was having a laugh. But we're not bottle jobs and we're not chokers because we are statistically, and I've reminded the manager of this all week, the best comeback team in the fucking league. We're the best mm-hmm. comeback team in all three leagues. Nobody's come from behind more than Peter B. United. So I know what's in the dressing room. And I've been saying it all season. You know, you, you, you trust the players, you trust the process. And you go 3-1 and you get one back. And then obviously the free kick goes in and there's like 15 minutes or whatever left. And you're thinking, yeah, we can do this. And then obviously you go into injury time and it's the fifth minute of injury time. Now the referee's given us nothing the whole fucking game. Yeah. No. Everyone wants to bitch and moan about the penalty. Get to fuck because we fucking deserve that. Yeah. I'm hearing some clown on Quest calling Sammy Schmodick's disgusting. I'm seeing loads of fans, Lincoln fans coming at me. Do me a fucking favor. You have won 17 penalties this season. Lincoln of the most penalties in the EFL. 17 fucking penalties. They're a great team. Great manager. Great fans. But cry me a fucking river if you don't mind after what's happened to us the last couple of years if we get a bit of luck. Regardless whether Sammy dived, fell over, the referee wanted to give us something, we fucking deserve that penalty. We should have had one. At their place when we drew 1-1, they have a free kick that hits our player's hand penalty. We have a free kick from Jono, hits their player's hand fucking straight in front of the ref, no penalty. That was fucking just desserts. Mm-hmm. Not only that, eight fucking years ago at Crystal Palace, a free kick was given that wasn't a free kick that led to us getting relegated. So that ghost has been exercised, go fuck yourself, and we got what we deserved. Now, everyone's sitting there. Let me ask you, any human being, who the fuck would want to take the responsibility? Oh, my final kick yeah. of the season to take a penalty when you've missed three with a legacy, the pressure, everything on the fucking line. Johnson Clark Harris has got melons as big as mine. All right. Because let me tell you right now, nobody, and I mean, nobody would want to take that penalty. I don't give a fuck who you are. I'm yeah. laughing afterwards with Jack Taylor, loving the bits because he, he's a very good penalty. Taylor. He's like, I'd fucking score that. No problem. I'm, like, Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure it'd be anyone. <laughs> Easy to say that. Hey, that fucking penalty. So for Jono to do that, then the whole place goes fucking wild. And then I'm thinking, this fucking referee is going to play another minute. The manager's trying to make a substitution, which is baffling. So I'm screaming at the manager, do not make a substitution. Because that referee will use that to stop and play, give an extra minute, because they're mm-hmm. about to then start moaning about the injustice of the penalty. We don't need it. Let them kick off and fucking deal with it. So the kick off goes to Joe Ward, a long ball. And he fucking miskicks it nearly out for a corner. I mean, fucking thank fuck the whistle then went. And then it's, then it's just like pandemonium. And the really, really funny thing is for our fans, throughout the game, at the start of the game when it's nil-nil, I could hear them all outside. And God bless them. I'm, I'm, I'm so upset for them not being able to be in the stadium. And they're all outside. And, you know, they're obviously enjoying it. 
and it's all cheers and it's great and then Lincoln go one nil up and there's still a cheer and there's still a bit of an expectation then half time 2-0 and the cheers become a bit of a murmur and a little bit of a okay then at 3-0 I can hear no one people are starting to go fucking home now right at 3-1 I can hear one person outside the stadium right at 3-2 sounds like about 50 people all right and then in the last five minutes, it sounds like fucking 20,000 people outside, right? So it was it was just, um, you know, sometimes you would go, yeah, I believe in God and I'm a Catholic. And you think there's a reason for things happening. And you get down on yourself and Tuesday, you're thinking, God, what have I done to upset the big man? And then you see what happened on Saturday. And I guess we had to go through Tuesday to enjoy Saturday. And if we'd drawn nil-nil on Saturday, the reaction after the game wouldn't have been the same that game won't go down as history, like as a game that will be played for years. Because you've got iconic games. Everyone has them, do you know what I mean? You've got Watford, Leicester, you know, Leicester penalty to go up, Watford break away and fucking score to either end. you got Doncaster years ago against Brentford. Um, penalty in the 90th minute, Brentford score, they get promoted. Doncaster fucking lose during the playoffs. Penalty saved. Donny go down to the other end and score. I mean, you, you've got moments that are just like wow moments. Do you know what I mean? I was at Istanbul in Turkey for Liverpool's 3 0 to 3 3. And that there, that 3 3 on Saturday was one of the best games you're ever going to see in your life. So for it to, to, to be so dramatic, to end in that way, to, yeah, I, I, I've got to be honest with you. I, I cried on the pitch around my wife. I was very emotional. And uh, yeah, it was, it was surreal, but great. And then, yeah, I'll, I'll let you talk for a minute. Yeah, but it was just, yeah, fucking, it was bonkers. No, as an outsider, like, well, I, an outsider, but I don't feel like I am an outsider now. I've got to know you. And, you know, I was cheering. I, I was cheering, like, you know, the rest of them. Um, dual screen, you know, I can't not watch City. But, but you know, my eyes were on you. <laughs> proper, proper. Um, um, you know, there was just this sense that well you know you go back to tuesday and and the fireworks and just that change of momentum you know mm -hmm. and you know those things happen like teams just get something that they're not just not on my watch all of a sudden they're like you know just something that happens that you know yeah. gives you some adversity to fight against mm -hmm. um, the game on saturday i never felt like you were out of it and you know even going into injury time i still felt there was something there but like you say to step up and take that penalty and whether that penalty was, you know, for, for me, it looked like he slipped. You know, it didn't look like he dived or anything like that. It was, you know, a slip and the referee decided. I think, to... I, I think out of exhaustion, he just like was like, right. and went down. You know, Sam um, probably walked 13 kilometers on Saturday. Do you know what I mean? And out of exhaustion, he's just fucking, yes, their player touched him. Was it a penalty? No, of course not. But who gives a fuck? Mm. You know what I mean? Like I said to you, you know, they, they've been awarded. And don't tell me all 17 of their penalties this fucking, you know, here's the thing. If you're Lincoln or any other club, you don't get to vote on penalties. Yeah, you know, um, and these things, it's cliche, but they even themselves out. And apparently, I mean, I've waited eight weird. years. Yeah, you know? apparently, apparently, you know, apparently. So you're talking about the emotion, you know, of midweek between um, the Tuesday game and then playing on Saturday. Like, where did that emotion come from, and where did that stress come from? You know, is it? Want, is it a, a personal achievement in wanting to, you know, be able to take the club back to the championship? Is it just because you can't do anything about it and you don't like being in situations that, you know, you don't really have influence at this point? Where do you think it came from? Eight years ago, I, I you know, I watched the most horrific thing happen, you know, and that will never be repeated, 54 points. And at that stage, you're thinking, you know, are the football gods saying, look, you don't belong in football anymore. Mm -hmm. Then I spent years trying to get us back in the playoffs and we're seventh, seventh. You know, two years ago, Doncaster had to beat Coventry. We had to beat Burton to get in the playoffs. We did our job. Doncaster beat Coventry. We missed out. Yeah. The following year, we're, we're nailed on for winning automatic promotion. And then COVID hits. And everyone decides to vote instead of playing football. And, you know, this season, you're thinking, okay, I mean, if there's ever a year you want to do it. And we go to Charlton. We, we get a hell of a win. And you're thinking, you know, brilliant. You know, wow. And then you play a team that's in shit form and everyone, I'm getting messages all Monday and Tuesday, congratulations, you're promoted. And I, you know me, I hate that. Mm -hmm. And the people who I didn't respond to, I apologize, but you know me better. If you know me really well, you don't send me that shit until we're promoted. I was getting emails, messages, I think I had 52 of them from people going, basically, you're done, it's up, enjoy tonight, ex-players, 
sports people, people in the yeah. industry, friends of mine from abroad, people I haven't heard from in fucking years, all of a sudden, oh, well done. And I'm like, well done what? And I only hope all the players aren't getting those messages. Yeah, That's the wrong mindset. And it's so disrespectful to Lincoln. It's so disrespectful to Doncaster. Because I'm not a disrespectful person when it comes to other teams. I respect that it's a 90-minute game and anyone can win on the day. So, you know, and then Tuesday night happens and then all of a sudden those messages are slowed down and stopped. Then all the posh fans, including me, are thinking, here we go again. You know, the, the football gods are trying to punish us. You know, Lincoln go and beat Shrewsbury, fair play to them, put pressure on us. They're the only team that can stop us going up. You're thinking mm -hmm. the worst. And I can't help but think the worst because of what's happened. And my wife's the person who said to me, like, what the fuck's the matter with you? Life doesn't work like that. Do you know what I mean? One doesn't dictate the other. You know, you can't think like that. You've got to think differently. You know, it's okay to think that some good things are going to happen. And sometimes you get in a mindset where you think shit things are just going to constantly happen. So it was nice, you know, to, to my mindset by Friday night was changing back that way. Because when I was younger, I was just such a positive believer and thinker. And maybe the hits have injured mm -hmm. me over years or whatever else. And they just do. You carry battle scars. But I just decided on Saturday, I'm just not going to be that asshole sitting there miserable as fuck for 90 minutes, moaning on the pitch of the players because they don't deserve that. I'm going to sit there. I'm going to be me, you know, who I used to be. I'm going to encourage the players. And even at three fucking nil down, I'm still going to encourage the players because you know what? We deserve this and we'll get what we deserve. Uh, and in the end, we did. So, you know, I'm not going to lie. It was so stressful. It's unbelievable. So the, 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 to hit the highs, the lows in such a short period of time, I was an emotional wreck Saturday night. The adrenaline was pumping. I couldn't sleep till 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And then all I wanted to do was sit at my computer on Sunday and start making plans. Mm -hmm. And because that's, because I've wanted to make these plans for the last two weeks and I couldn't allow myself to sit down and go championship budget, championship targets. I couldn't do it because I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to put it out there. You know, I'm arrogantly thinking, but you know, me, 12 years ago would have would have been like right you know i'm assuming we're in all the things i preach to the hard truth you know mm -hmm. on, on hardtruthbusiness.com you know our, our private community you know i'm going against the things i'm preaching so i'm becoming a hypocrite so i've got to you know i've got to be me so i got a bit of me back on saturday and and i've needed that back because it's been missing for a while even though i felt recruitment and everything this year was probably the best it's been from my perspective um job wise you know yeah. I, I, there's still some of me missing and, and and that was lost to palace that day and i think i got it back uh and yeah so that's that so what did you you talked about the near misses the last few years you know and taking kind of disregarding last season um and how it ended you know you talked about the best recruitment as an example like what did you do differently this year that took you from being challenging from the playoffs to ultimately um even though it, it won't look like it was um, not an easily won promotion, but you know what I mean? It's You didn't go to the last day. You were points clear. You know, you made it difficult for yourself the last couple of games, but you've, you've, you're, you're clearly the second, if not the best team in the league. Well, what, what was different this year? Listen, I'm going to give Hull the credit for being the best team in the league. Yeah. They won the title, so fair play to them. Um, we were the two best teams by a mile. I was on Sky earlier, and uh, we were. Uh, and what was different? I think... I think it's been a two season, one season, if that makes sense. I think if you look up since last season to this season, they've rolled into the same mm -hmm. because of COVID and the lockdown and the shutdown. And then starting this season, we kept all the same players from last season. We lost the best player in League One. We went out and got the next best player in League One and made him the best player in League One. Yep. But all the pieces we put together, we brought back Brown. We brought in Johnson Clark Harris. I made the Schmodix deal a permanent deal. You know, posh fans don't know this, but, you know, in the summer, Bristol didn't want to sell Sammy. Sammy wanted to play at Bristol. The reason we bought Ryan Broom was because we weren't getting Sammy Schmox. Mm -hmm. You know, the gaffer had moved on and he wanted Ryan Broom and we went out and did it. But I didn't give up on Schmox. I went at Sammy. I went at Bristol. I have 19 emails between myself and Mark Ashton at Bristol where I didn't stop. And I probably looked desperate. Um, but I'm glad I was. Uh, and Barry even told me to move on. You know, I met Sammy's parents and, and, and people around him that advise him. And then I spoke to the boy directly myself. So I knew he was an important part of how we press, what we do. You know, the, 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 the hard yards he gives you up top, you know, 
And then Sammy didn't start the season while he was under pressure, but he had issues going off the pitch that have now been resolved because him and his missus are, are having a, a new baby, do you know what I mean, yeah. in, in a few months' time. So, And he was getting down on himself. So, And once the precursor was, once he clicked, probably November time onwards, you know, he's been, I think he's got 15 league goals in like 30 games, do you know what I mean, since then. So so it was, it was putting the pieces together as best we could. And, and I couldn't have done it without the financial support of my partners who allowed yeah. it to happen. And obviously, Sal and Ivan Tony helped in a big way. But the financial fair play restrictions with the new rules with the salary cap meant I'd maxed us out pretty mm -hmm. much, you know, because I knew what I wanted. I didn't want to have to do January business. And, and I knew for us to be successful, we needed to rely on our younger players to come in and make a difference when needed. And all the fans are going, you didn't sign anyone in January and this could blow. And I knew it wouldn't because I knew what we had. I knew Harrison Burroughs could step in for Dan Butler. I knew he could step in for Dembele, who changed the formation. I knew Canu could step in for Joe Ward. I knew Ricky J. Jones, who was phenomenal pre-season, but then got a very bad injury and missed five months. He was he would have had an electric season if it weren't mm -hmm. for like, a leading goal scorer pre-season. I knew we had Mo Issa. I knew in midfield we had Louis Reed, we had Ethan Hamilton, who when Jack Taylor was out for seven games. I know all the fans were saying we didn't have the strength and depth, but we did. We had the best squad depth-wise and we had a great balance. We had the experience, we had the the teenagers from the academy, and then we had our gem talents like your Jack Taylors of the world in there. And I also knew the staff wise, we added a key ingredient, the great assistant manager in the summer. So I knew on paper, everything looked incredibly good. Everything looked like it was built to win a league. And we should have probably won the league. Mm -hmm. You know, we had the best home form in the country, but we only won one of our last five home games. You know, we drew the rest or whatever and lost with the chilling them. If we if we'd done our job like we did at home, we'd have won the league. But and if Jack Taylor hadn't got injured for six games, because he is the best in the business, yeah. we would have been done and dusted by mid-April. Um, so I knew all those things were there. And I also knew um, we needed calm throughout the season. Even when people were calling for the manager's head in December when we had a sticky run, all the things that were going on, me and my partners were pretty much on the same level of trust the process, let it play out, let the manager, let the staff do their work, do their job. And, and it was a real Herculean effort from everyone at the club because you've not just got the ownership, the manager, you know, Baz, whatever else, the player. You, you've got the staff around that who booked the hotels, who did the COVID test, who all those, you know, hoops we had to jump through, through a pandemic season. Um, you know, people furloughed, people on furlough, people, you know, at work, not at work, you know, sitting at home. Fans, you know, older fans who were devastated, you know, the I follow drama through the season where it worked, it didn't work, you know? So there's all that going on in the background. What do I always say? Well, everyone else is losing their shit. You've got to like keep your head. Mm -hmm. at no stage really in January did I want to go out. I said to the manager, do you want me to try and work something here so we can bring in more players? And he agreed. He was like, chairman, you said at the start of the month, let's not do anything. We're at the end of the month. We're not doing anything. And that was kind of like the best, the, the best business we did in January was actually doing fuck all. Yeah. So, because it probably sent a real message to the team. We're confident in you. And a big part of all of that is the sports science. You know, we had a new sports scientist. We had a new physiotherapist who stepped up, who who's just goes qualifications. And they they kept our team fit. Like Saturday, we pretty much, had, everyone was fit, mm -hmm. you know, for the final few games. that That's massive after a pandemic season with so many games back to back. So the credit that goes to them who were pretty new in the role, you know, for the job they've done. You know, it's a Herculean effort, but I guess all the stars aligned because they needed to, um, you, you know. Clark Harris, he won the EFL Player of the Year, and he deserved it. Best player in the league by a mile. You know, he got COVID during the season. Right. You know, and still has got 31 goals. And, you know, a lot of people have struggled after COVID and, you know, whatever else. And um, he's just been a leader, someone you needed. Do you know what I mean? And, and in, in fairness to him, when you compare it to other strikers, never once did he have his head turned. Never once did he talk about wanting to go to other clubs like I've had with previous big move strikers. His goal was to win promotion. Uh, and, and that was brilliant to have that too. So all those little things I'm blabbering on about there you mm -hmm. played such, such an important part throughout the season, yeah. So, you know, I'm hesitant to ask too much about looking forward because, you know, you've got to enjoy the moment. But you already said that you've uh, started your planning for next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a, Yesterday I sat down, I did a budget document that I've sent off to the CFO who then look at all the bits I've added and taken out and then put it together for, we have an owner's meeting on Wednesday. I did a 
um, an analysis recruitment document, ins and outs, who's staying, who's going. And obviously then we'll go through that with the gaff and he'll have his list and I'll have my list and put together the positions we need strengthened. New contract uh, list as well because there's players we're going to need to do new contracts with. Um, what else in there? Stadium, you know, about trying to get temporary seats or if we can get an extra year standing because of the COVID situation, you yeah. know, because we're out of, out of exemption on that. Um, what else? There was like five different documents I've been working on since kind of 9 a.m. yesterday morning. So, you know, the manager and everyone, I think we're all in the pub and, and all having a good time. Texted me yesterday evening or whatever, and I'm like, listen, and they're like, fucking hell, you're working on all that. I said, yeah, because that's who I am. Yeah. And, you know, I want to get a head start because I want to go home by the end of the week to America. And I want to, like, give a good five, six weeks just to the kids and that. And yeah. just like, you know, we, we've, we're we moving house. We've got a lot going on. Um. One of my kids is graduating from middle school. There's exams in high school. I just want to be, you know, full on dad, full on husband, you know, because I've been missing an action for large periods. Mm -hmm. you know, I came to England knowing I might have to be here till the end of May with the playoffs and the playoff final. And my wife knew that and was okay with that. And she takes the slack. So enough of her taking the slack. I'll take some slack and then get everyone on holiday. The other thing I was working on yesterday was preseason tour. You know, it's all those things, you know, which are really exciting to go through. But I want to make a special mention to the fans on Saturday because we went out and we were able to celebrate with them outside. Yeah. You know, yeah, I know it's not that there was some wet wipe on Twitter was coming at me over the whole COVID thing and everything else. But look, the UK's pretty much got herd immunity. And um, you got more chance of catching gonorrhea than COVID probably in a lot of areas because it's been it's been knocked back so much. We weren't body surfing and diving into the crowd. We were, you know, we were probably six to ten feet away. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to calm fucking down. The average age of the people I saw in the crowd were probably 23 with pimples. So, you know, it wasn't like it was a super spreader. Um, so for the for the person who felt they had to tweak that, get a fucking life. Um, so, yeah, but it was really, really enjoyable to have that 10, 15 minutes with them outside mm -hmm. because they've missed all of this. And that's fucking devastating. Do you know what I mean? That they've missed it. But, um, you know, the great news is, is of August, it'll be full back and, and, and all our fans will be back. And they'll be watching championship football. What are you... Well, a couple of things. You know, I actually had a question in from Zach. And Zach asked kind of, what's a natural progression for a team promoted from League One uh, to take before they're kind of consistently challenging for at least the playoffs in the championship? Is there a, you know, an, an hour two or a three or a four or whatever the years are yeah. journey that you take? Or do you just try and be the best that you can be? Um, so, yeah. Chips so no, 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 no. I, I, yes. So the way you look at it is, is that we haven't been there for a few years, so it's changed a bit, but we still have memories of what it's like. So the most important thing is you need physicality to do well in the championship. You need an identity. Um, the manager will probably have to look at formations and changes and identity. Um, you need to be physically fit. You need to be quicker. You need to be stronger. You need to be technically good enough to step up to that level. Um, we feel, of course, there's going to be a percentage of the squad who are out of contract, players leaving, who the manager will deem probably not being able to step up mm -hmm. at that level. So what we need to do is we need to find our feet and and, and quickly, because you don't get five months in the championship. You, you've got to find your feet. Once you find your feet, you then start growing and improving. And we feel with a good balance of a young squad, good academy talents, the players we have, the additions we'll make, that those players will evolve and turn into very good championship players. It won't happen straight away. It will take some time. And you'd like to think, you go through the first season and you finish comfortably top 15 and then everyone's used to the level. Yeah. Um, season two and season three, you want to be looking up towards the top 12. And then season four and five, you definitely want to be going for the playoffs. Now, if we could do a Barnsley mm -hmm. or you know, put ourselves in a position like Brentford who are one of the best championship teams now, that would be a natural evolution to look at and go, they do it really well. So we want to match that because they're teams who are constantly punching above their weight. What we have to our advantage is we recruit very well. And, you know, to sell a striker for seven, eight million in League One, you'll sell them for 20 in the, in the championship. Mm -hmm. That will allow a club like ours, who don't have the big crowds at the moment, to compete really well in the championship. So I want to set us up so that we're in that position. Um, you know, and, and look, it's easy to look backwards. It's easy to go into it with apprehension. It's easy to go in and think, oh, everyone thinks we're going to be a punching bag. That's not my mindset. It's not my partner's mindset. It's not the football club's mindset. My manager deserves to be a championship manager. He's not going there for a fucking one year holiday. So yeah, so so that that that's where I am in that in that yeah. line of thought. What are you looking to look what are you looking forward to the most about the championship? 
bigger crowds because of the away crowds and our fans enjoying that atmosphere. Yeah. Um, seeing younger players step up to a level that, you know, they can grow into and be really good at. Um, international breaks, <laughs> you know, you get a, a couple of weeks off just to like, you know, decompress. Especially uh, after this season. Although yeah, not no, as a fan. Yeah, not, this it, this yeah. season was great as a fan, but not as a player. Yeah, 100%. Um, seeing our staff uh, get paid more because they're in the championship, you know, and, and, and that's really important. Growing the club commercially. Um, you know, three magnificent things happened this season. One, we bought the stadium. Yeah. Two, by the end of the summer, we'll have moved up to Cat 2, Youth Academy. That's really important. And then three, the promotion. So there are three really, really massive things to happen for a club our size. And I dare say that's golden era time for us. And I'd like to see us have a bit of a golden era. We deserve it. And our fans deserve it. And the city deserves it. So, you know, we're hoping all the things, the planning, the work, everything that's going in now will lead to a really, really good period for the football club. Well, it's uh, co- first of all, just congratulations again. Yeah. You know, I know it's been, uh, especially the last week or so, has been pretty tough <laughs> bringing it over the line. So, uh, you know, you can take oh, yourself to sit, sit back for a day and then get back to work. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm at it now. I'm, I'm just nonstop with just the shit I've got documents now. Of course, you've got agents nonstop ringing, you know, the usual people sniffing yeah. opportunity. Look, that's the industry. That's the game. I get it, you know. Um, this is the exciting stuff. And, I'm going to enjoy it and, and, and embrace it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have to have that attitude going into this league. The championship's one of the best leagues in the world. One of the toughest, but one of the best. And you can go into it with, oh, we're the underdogs, we're going to get crushed. You go into it and go, we're here to compete. Coventry showed they can compete. Watch Coventry now do better next year. Yeah. Luton showed they can compete. You, you have to go into it and you have to get your bearings. You have to do your, the recruitment's got to be, is, is really important. You know what I mean? The, the, the coaching. Little things. I, I'll give you an example. One of our biggest deficiencies this season has been set pieces. True no fault of our own, and that's not a dig at the staff, the manager. They all realise that. We're not great at set pieces. Corners, set pieces. If you want to compete in the championship, you need to be really, really competitive in set pieces in both boxes. So Liverpool went out. They knew they weren't good at set pieces. They went and signed Van Dijk. They got a specialist coach in for free kicks, throw-ins, all those things. The little percentage makes a difference. So, you know, I'm not going to lie. That could be in my budget. Um, sports psychologist mm-hmm. sessions, you know, for the players. Again, that could be in the budget. I want to give the manager and his great staff all the inches they need to, to make us better. Uh, and, and that's not us trying to spend silly money or being really wasteful. But I want to invest in the right areas, not just on players, but on things that matter. And that's infrastructure and all those things. So, yeah. So just to you know, round it all off, that they're also in my mindset right now. Planning. Yeah. How, how much does your budget, not from a um, a pounds perspective, you know, I don't want you to give away your budget, but how much how much does the club grow from going from League One to the Championship? You get a lot more income, but our wage bill is just going through the fucking roof. Yeah, you know I mean, we've got some big players who are on you know serious good money, you know, for Peter United in the Championship. The other thing is what people don't realise is I've just gone through the Excel cheat there. We have a £1.2 million bonuses to pay out mm-hmm. between players, staff, and clubs, which actually the club thing's good. I, I'm, I'm happy about that. Yeah. Like, you know, one club that's just been relegated from the Football League is going to get 100 grand as a, a promotion bonus. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, Bristol Rovers from the John O'Deal, it was a promotion bonus, six figures, and then it was 50 grand from winning the Golden Boot. So they've just got, you know, and I'm, yeah. I'm delighted to see those because when I, by players, I always throw in add-ons. And that's really, really important for clubs so that the wealth gets spread, you know, when people do well and you buy their players. So, and in fairness, a special mention, the Bristol Rovers chairman messaged me after the game. He's a class act, why you? He's just a lovely guy, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, that meant a lot as well. So that was nice. Yeah. On the flip side, you've got everyone talking about Ivan Tony still. And, um, you know, his move to the Premier League one way or the other. Hey, gravy, gravy, that's gravy. You know, if Brentford go up, we get a million quid. If they don't, they sell them, we're going to do all right. Mm-hmm. So that's gravy. Look, if Brentford went up, ideally it pays all our bonuses that we've got to find the money for over the next few months. So, you know, it's gravy. That's the way it works. Look, Ivan Tony will be going for 40 million. And if Liverpool have any fucking sense about them, they're going to buy them. Do you know what I mean? Because I tell you right now, don't be shocked if one of the big four clubs goes and buys them. Right. What I'm here. You know, that could happen. Um, now, I'm being disrespectful to Brentford because they'll probably think, well, we go up, we're keeping them. 
But I, I know the kind of money those clubs offer. And uh, and I'm sure Brentford will probably be knocking on my door to get the next dive in the <laughs> straight after. I mean, so that also happens too. Yeah. Um, I have to ask you just one thing before we wrap up. I'll, I'll bring up one topic because it's very topical. Um, and, you know, moving on from um, from your promotion to the Premier League and Man United Liverpool yesterday. And really the whole... Um, you know, Super League, we talked about it, obviously, the last time we recorded and by the time we published, it moved on pretty quickly and it all kind of uh, unraveled. Um, yeah. What were your thoughts about what went on at Old Trafford yesterday? I said in Sky Sports this morning that, you know, one, I was good because I was watching the game. You know, two, look, the Glazers don't give a fuck about that. Yeah. They're not going to care. They're billionaires. You know, unless someone goes and offers them double the money it's worth, they're not going to cash out and sell out. You know, they've just won the Super Bowl in America. They don't give a toss. I didn't like the fans breaking into the stadium right. and into the dressing room and throwing shit up onto the galley where the commentators were. We've seen a lot of demonstrations and shit the last 15 months. Some of them peaceful, a lot of them not so peaceful. And I don't like that. I don't like anarchy. And I read that a police person was hit in the head with a bottle mm. and potentially disfigured. That can happen. Um, so I don't know what Man United were doing security-wise because everyone knew that was going to happen. There was some sort of a, a, a demonstration planned. So to allow them to to break your security and get into the stadium, you know, shame on United for allowing that to happen. To I understand where the fans are coming from. I'm not criticizing the ones who wanted to come out and protest because of what's going on. They're all happy with the ownership. They want the Glazers out. Whether that happens, that's another story. Um, you know, you also have to go down the route of so many people have been locked up for a year. There's so much pent up aggression mm -hmm. and anger and resentment. And anything like that, it's like we've seen with the, the riots and everything going on in America. People are, you know, mentally, they've just been down for a year uh, and it gives them that release. And unfortunately, some people take it too far uh, because, you know, we, we live in America with a constitution where you're, all, you know, your right to protest is one of your fundamental rights. Yeah. And, and absolutely no problem with that. I, I agree with that. You know what I mean? I support any kind of, you know, right to protest and, and get your point across. What I don't support is assaulting police officers. I don't support jumping on cars. I don't support, you know, the destruction of people's property. Yeah. I don't that, support any of that. And that becomes a story then as well, doesn't it? The story that, isn't then what the, we're protesting well, against. It's it a story in America. The left media don't like to make it <laughs> a story. So, you know, I'd like it to be the story because it's the truth, but it's yeah. never shown that where we live, unfortunately, Phil. Um, but the real story is the people at harms, the people who own the businesses that are destroyed, the, you know, the police officers, the security officers, the, the people who are putting their lives on the line, getting bottles thrown at them, you know, getting things. You, that can't be the way it is as a society. Um, so, yes, all football fans, if you, if you want to make change at Man United, don't buy a season ticket. Don't spend money with the club. Starve them of income. Yeah. You know, empty the stadium when the fans are back. But that won't happen because they're an international brand and people are desperate right. for football. And they might have an odd couple of games where they do that, but it won't happen. So it, as much as you want the members of the European Super League fiasco, all you can now stand by and hope is, is that new regu regulation and legislation comes in to stop it ever happening. Mm -hmm. And that way then it's done. But as regards to moving the Glazers on, you ain't going to do it. It's such a small percentage as well of when you say they don't really care. I mean, what's unfortunately a few hundred people in a, um, a for a, 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 I mean, what they get, what, 70 odd thousand every week, millions around the world. To them, it's a drop in the bucket. Now, it's interesting to see, you know, has the tide turned in terms of people, uh, you know, did they, was it one step too far and what happens next with the Super League uh, or whether it will all be forgotten in a year's time and they'll try a run at something else? I think what happened now, I always said, was negotiations. Yeah. And, and I think obviously there'll be a power shift. And I think the Premier League and everyone in, in power will be wanted to put restrictions in place that it can never happen again. And maybe they're going to have to, give a little bit more over to the bigger sides to keep them happier. And the bigger sides are going to have to eat some humble pie and shit for a few uh, months. But in a year's time, we won't be talking about that. Right. Super League. So the Champions League deal will be done and all the new money and all of that. And, and it'll be forgotten. And if Man United win the league next year, these protests will be forgotten. Mm -hmm. So that's just football. And that is the way it goes. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was not nice to see. And, and worse than that, a lot of people who, or vulnerable who can't leave their homes or haven't left their homes, you know, didn't get to see a big game of football they yeah. probably tried to watch. Yeah. So they like that, isn't it? All right. Well, let's uh, let's close things up this week. I really wanted to focus on, you know, your last week and um, 
the promotion and really what it was like behind the scenes. So thank you as always for uh, sharing those insights. Um, next week, then uh, I'd like to just uh, get into a little bit of a backward look at the season. Like, like let's review the season and hundred uh... percent. I think I think we talk next week about the season, the things that have happened, maybe some next gen superstars from the football league that can mm-hmm. play higher up. Maybe a little bit of a, a chat about the Euros that are coming up. You know things like that so what we're probably going to do is we're probably going to wrap by the end of may and then have a break for about yeah. six or seven weeks do you know what i mean and then come back just before the new season we'll start like a new season of the podcast so because this time it'll be a championship based podcast you know what i mean so well, at uh, least it will for one of us <laughs> listen <laughs> we will be winning the title next year come on we better be positive thinking yeah we better be um all right well we're going to go off and record our business pod um sure. if you're interested in joining that community of course always go to hardtruthbusiness.com and you can sign up right there um until next week thanks everybody we'll talk to you take again care soon. everyone thanks for all your message your support all the best